everyone, and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News, Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining us. On today's program, we travel across the state of Alaska once again, but this time we do it via trails. For centuries, our ancestors lived off the land, gathered berries, hunted the game, and fished the fish. Today, we lead you on a trail of stories, a trail that generations lived by. From the far reaches of space to the depths of the deepest ocean, mankind has left a path for others to follow and someday go beyond. For the indigenous people of Alaska, it is a path still walked today. From the stories that are passed down from generation to generation, to the land that provides the necessities of life, the ways of our past are the ways of our today. We are as connected to our history as we are to our land. A land that holds the stories of where we came from, a land that holds the stories of where we are going. <laughs> Connecting us to this land and allowing us access to rural areas across the state are trails, the natural development of beings crossing the land. They mark our passing and guide our way for the future. Many of these trails tell a story, whether it be one of hardships or a story of happiness. For centuries, our ancestors used these trails for traveling, hunting, and subsistence activities, and even recreational purposes. Indigenous people were existing in Nunavak Island and before the Western culture came to Nunavak Island. Um, Nunavak Island was uh, uh, populated all, around, all, all along the coast uh, and since we're Eskimos, if you will, uh, we live on off both land and sea uh, uh, food sea mammals, land animals, uh, plants and vegetables and birds. Uh, so therefore we were uh, nomads, if you will. And to migrate with the animals to the other side of the island, the native people of Nunavak Island used trails. It's these trails that interwove the people of the area with the land, waters, and wildlife. Today, Nunavak Island is a national wildlife refuge and home to the Chupik people of Makoyuk. Marvin Keokin is the land planner for the NEMA Corporation, which stands for Nunavak Island, Makoyuk, Alaska. Marvin is currently working on a plan to put all of the island trails on GPS or Global Positioning System to allow visitors and locals to traverse the trails year-round in all weather conditions. Marvin has seen the changes over the years and recalls a time of not so long ago. Walking was the main source from going from point A to point B. But now that we have boats, outboard motors, and of course ATV, all-train vehicles, Walking bipedal, walking is replaced by ATV. So um, uh, in using those traditional trails, uh, rather than walking, we use ATV now. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, it uh, destroys the fragile tundra. And it takes some time to uh, have the tundra regrow. And then in the process, the erosion uh, takes place and the rest is uh, not not good when it's destroyed meaning the topsoil is destroyed along with the uh, plant uh, 
my experience is using the ATV trail and and sometimes you have to go or, or around the old trail which is you, impassable because it's already destroyed and then if you keep on using this particular trail the, rather than this old trail it seems like it regrows within a year but it's not as uh, it have to grow more to back to its original but then you can, you can still see the scarring uh, the plant is different it's uh, color is different and you can see the scar if you will on those um, um, on those trails many would just say quit using ATVs that's a lot like saying quit driving cars and trucks to the rest of the world let's face it in a time of technology no one wants to be left behind it certainly is destructive but at the same time, it gets me to point A to point B faster than walking or running. Um, and we're not going backwards because the technology is here, we, we use it. With the increasing number of people who visit Nunavak Island, the island trails are feeling the effects of man and machine. Travel throughout the state of Alaska has changed dramatically over the past 100 years throughout the interior of Alaska, along the coasts, all across and through the state of Alaska, travel has changed. We've gone from kayaks and canoes to skips and power boats, and from dog sleds and on foot to ATVs. And unfortunately, this new mode of travel, although it's very convenient, has left their mark. This is the Chistachina Trail in the Atna region, home of Alaska's interior Athabascan people. The Chistachina Trail is a trail that has connected several villages together for centuries, allowing access to different communities and most importantly, access to the land and the resources that inhabit the area. The significance of this trail is enormous, but it evolves around subsistence, food, and you know, hunting, gathering activities. And a, a good example, in other words, like now it's berry picking time. And you can see that some of these berries over here are becoming ripe, and blueberries. Within about a week or so, they'll be ready for harvest or picking, so blueberry pie on the way. Trails have been a part of native life and continue to hold their cultural significance today, allowing access to the tundra and wildlife or access to surrounding villages. Today, however, we are faced with a situation that demands attention. This, with these marks on it, is a result of a track vehicle. This here is a result of ATV. This here is possibly the result of a four by truck. Today, the trail is impassable in many sections due to excessive overuse. Because of all-terrain vehicles and track vehicles, our trails across the state are becoming hazardous, unattractive, and in many cases, unusable. This here is a good example of what I mean by the public making use of other routes of the trail. For instance, this may be the, the specific trail that you're supposed to travel on. But because the public can't get around this swamp here, they instead make a new route to get around that. You will see this kind of damage or this kind of trail cutting all along the entire link of this trail. In some places, this width of the trail would become 300 feet or more in width or even larger in some cases. The increasing number of hunters and recreational trail users have left their mark in many sacred trails, a mark that may take centuries to heal.
For the native people of rural Alaska, ATVs have become the vehicle of choice. But that choice comes at a high cost. In Nunalakleet, all-terrain vehicles are used year-round to help make life in the village a great deal easier. Most rural Alaskans rely on the four-wheeler and snow machine to get around the village, to haul people and supplies, to travel to surrounding villages, and especially for hunting the abundance of wildlife that roams the tundra. With their adaptability to Alaska's rugged terrain, ATVs are ideal for rural living. People really do need the four-wheeler in the village. This is their transportation. This is cheap transportation. They, they don't have to pay a lot of money up front to buy a four-wheeler. They don't have to, it's not high maintenance. And uh, gas prices are so high and they don't use that much gas. They haul wood with it. They go to the store with it. They go pick berries with it. They hunt with it. Uh, I mean, they really depend on it. There are a lot of trails on the corporation land. Um, hunting trails mostly, hunting and berry picking. Uh, Four-wheeler is a practical tool for our people. Stanton and Irene Kachetag still use one of the local trails in Unalakleet for ptarmigan hunting. Here in Unalakleet, Alaska, trails are as important to the people as the ATVs that ride on those trails. For it was the black bear trails that local hunters would follow to catch their prey. Today, ATVs have made hunting and berry picking amongst many tasks much easier and efficient. And while the people of rural Alaska prosper from ATV use, it's the tundra that suffers. Many locals are noticing the scarring of their land due to extensive ATV use, a scarring that will most likely remain for years to come. As far as the country landscape, it sure has changed. And unfortunately, not for the better. Uh, a lot of the tundra has been scarred up from four-wheeler tracks, and uh, I don't think it will get any better. Well, some of the changes I've seen in the ATV trails in the past few years, I noticed some of the ruts are getting deeper it's just because more and more people own ATVs now. One thing that I that bothers me is when uh, people start to use them uh, without following one uh, pathway or one way. I, I don't mind using them for hunting, but I don't like to see them going from uh, from hill to hill or anywhere or anyway. These uh, terrain vehicles disturb the vegetation, Very like nice. berries and uh, willows and everything. They disturb that. So uh, that's something that I'd like to always pass on to our young generation. Not only has man and machine left a path of destruction in their wake, but today, trail degradation has led to a much more serious situation. The environmental impacts that ATV use has on the vegetation, soil, site hydrology, wildlife and fisheries habitats can change the ecosystem of an area forever. We had time I could go to places where I could show you our traveling across the trails, as I said, across the wetlands I showed, told you earlier, actually produced a stream bed. The stream beds now flow right down the four-wheeler trails. And the reason that we chose that area to drove, drive through with a four-wheeler to begin with, because it was the drier margin area. Now it's the stream bed, and it's causing serious erosion over on the Fox Creek side there. You know, you can't even get through there anymore because of it, actually. Now. In Homer, Alaska, 
The effects of ATV use on the tundra can easily be seen, especially upon the wetlands in the area. So this is the consequence of these trails and in really wet conditions that we still have here, residual wetness, is they'll just eat you up. So it's a real inconvenience to the riders. It's kind of a misconception that people want to find these and that's their objectives, but after you've pushed your machine out of a couple holes like this, you've had enough for the day. Kevin Meyer is a surface protection specialist with the National Park Service, Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program. Through research and technology, the National Park Service, working with a variety of organizations and concerned individuals, has come up with long-term solutions to a growing concern. This is a typical wetland opening that connects the, the trailhead to Caribou Lake. It's about seven miles of terrain that looks just like this. The cotton grass that we see tufted out here is an indication of a very aquic or wet environment. It's wide open terrain that in the wintertime it makes perfect passage for snow machines. But in the summertime, this is a very fragile and sensitive environment that's easily torn up by ATV use. You can see the tracks that extend across here. And it's not unusual, especially during hunting season, to have the entire surface to have been trafficked by ATV users. This is typically what happens when you run ATVs on, on wetlands. Um, the wheel traffic abrades the wetlands and strips the vegetation, exposes this underlying muck soil. And it doesn't take very long before we've got an area that won't support the ATV use. What happens then is people end up moving across the entire area, stripping and denuding the area, and causing accelerated erosion, which washes into the local streams and impacts fisheries values. So we've been experimenting with these two materials. One, this is geoblock. It's a meter long material by a half a meter long material. It's uh, made of recycled high density polyethylene plastic and is a 40% opening. It's two inches thick and has um, excellent weight transference characteristics. Um, and we bind the individual panels together and that becomes the wear surface. And you can also see how the vegetation is regenerating up through it. The other material that we've been experimenting with is called SolGrid. This product is made in Quebec, slightly different um, than the GeoBlock in that it has these, in, these uh, integrated flexor units. And that gives us some advantages in thermal expansion. It also allows it to drape a little more naturally across the landscape. And the idea is to set this on top so that the tires from the vehicles aren't churning up and creating more mud holes. And with the weight transfer that occurs on this, they spread their weight out. They have much less impact on the ground. Exactly. And they'll be less likely, if they can travel on this, they'll be less likely to try to avoid a bog or a mud hole. Working together, the National Park Service, Cook Inlet Keepers, the Homer Soil and Water Conservation District, and local user groups such as the Snowmads are not only donating time and money towards repairing the existing trail, but are also rerouting portions of the trail that run through wetlands, rerouting them up into higher grounds. These materials will support trail use much, much better than the muck soils and the wetlands. And you can see here, a single track that's probably had thousands of passes is still in one lane and is uh, holding up really, really well. So this is the way nature hardens trails in contrast um, to what the trails look like going across the wetlands. These volunteers are clearing a path that will soon become the main trail to the popular Caribou Lake. Through the hard work and efforts of these individuals and others like them, trail users will be able to enjoy the pristine beauty of the wilderness that surrounds them while preserving the wetlands. All this is is dead beetle kill trees that I drug out here with the four-wheeler and put in place. 
local resident John Cole has taken matters into his own hands. Utilizing the dead spruce bark beetle kill trees that overwhelm the area, Cole has constructed a series of boardwalks that lend themselves well to ATV traffic. Not only are these boardwalks cheaper than the synthetic geoblock, but by clearing these dead spruce trees, Cole is essentially removing a fuel source should a forest fire occur. No matter what method is used for hardening different surfaces, it all means a lot of hard work. The Middle Fork Trail near the interior of Alaska is also getting a major makeover. Here we have the opportunity to see firsthand how the trail hardening process takes place. Specialists agree that hardening these trails will protect the soil for 30 to 50 years, allowing for new vegetation to grow and wildlife and fisheries habitats to prosper, provided we all do our part to take care of our trails and preserve the paths that history has taken. Through the combined efforts of agencies and dedicated individuals of rural Alaska, we can ensure that our children and their children will have a way to explore the wonders of nature that surround them, a way to ensure that the stories of yesteryear will live on in the minds and in the trails of today. Isn't this a great program? Now, if you want more information on managing some of these trails that have been degraded, the National Park Service has put out this fabulous book called Managing Degraded Off-Highway Vehicle Trails in Wet, Unstable, and Sensitive Environments. To get a copy of this program, simply call the number on the screen. I want to thank every one of you for joining us for Heartbeat Alaska. Join us again next week. God bless every single one of you, and we'll see you then. It's Heartbeat, Alaska. It's Heartbeat, Alaska. You can hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Jeannie's show. Purchase a copy of this program, ask for heartbeat number 120602, and send your check or money order to Junie Green Productions, 6216 Old Seward Highway, Anchorage, Alaska, 99518. Or give us a call at 907-563-7440.